The lac operon has several parts to it, but we're going to go through each of these parts and talk about their functions. In prokaryotic cells, genes are often found in groups called operons. So actually what we tend to see is not just one gene on its own followed by another gene. We can actually find one or often more than one gene grouped together into a particular region called an operon. For example, here in the lac operon we have three genes. So by definition, an operon is a group of genes under the same regulatory mechanism and they get all transcribed in one single unit. So instead of just transcribing one of these genes at a time and separately, what actually happens is that all of these genes are transcribed together. So these genes might be grouped together because they have similar roles. Usually if one is needed, then they're all needed. So they all get transcribed in one massive go. The operons are useful because the genes that code for the proteins involved in a specific metabolic pathway can all be switched on or off. Rather than having to switch on one at a time, we can simply switch all of them from being off to being on, at which point an mRNA would then be made containing the information for each of the three genes. So as you can imagine, there are different operons based on the genes that fit into a category. For example, one operon may have genes for a particular pathway, and then there'll be another operon for genes for another pathway. So an example of this is where many bacteria, like E. coli, they tend to use glucose as their main respiratory substrate, just like we do, because glucose is very easy to metabolize. So if glucose is in their local environment, the bacterial cells will simply take up the glucose and put it through the process of respiration. And through this process, they can get their energy or ATP. However, bacteria live in lots of different environments and sometimes glucose might not always be available. So these bacteria can actually use other respiratory substrates, for example, lactose. So if glucose is unavailable, then the E. coli bacteria tends to use another sugar, which is lactose. And lactose is a disaccharide of glucose and galactose. If they're using lactose, and so they're carrying out metabolism of lactose, it requires different proteins and enzymes compared to when they use glucose in metabolism. So glucose is used in respiration to make ATP, and so is lactose. But obviously, glucose is a different molecule, and so the enzymes that are needed are different to those used for lactose. So the proteins that need to be transcribed and made for lactose metabolism are different to those which needs to be made for glucose metabolism. These proteins which get made are only produced when glucose is absent and lactose is present. So the proteins to break down lactose are only made in the case where lactose is present but glucose is not available. And the reason for this is it, it preserves resources or it conserves resources. So for example, if glucose was absent and lactose was present, there's no point in making enzymes that metabolize glucose. It's a waste of amino acids and a waste of energy to make them, and therefore that means there's less energy to do other useful things. So if there's no glucose, we don't make these enzymes, we only make those referred to lactose metabolism. The genes that code for the proteins for lactose metabolism are located together in a group and therefore in an operon, and we call this operon the lac operon, hence lac for lactose. So these genes only come on when the lactose is available, and there's no point in having them spread across the genome where they're all scattered. So all of these three genes are kept together for lactose metabolism. So they're either turned on or off based on whether lactose is present. And the expression of all of the proteins in that operon can therefore be easily repressed when they're not needed. So if glucose is present, then none of these get transcribed and none of the proteins get made. However, if glucose becomes absent, but lactose is available, then these get transcribed, and because they're in an operon, all of them get transcribed, and therefore we make the enzymes which are used to metabolize lactose. In order to understand how the lac operon works, we need to understand its structure. So the lac operon is basically a group of genes involved in the metabolism of lactose. So this whole structure is the lac operon, and as you can see, it's got different sections, and each of these are different parts of the DNA, and they all have specific functions. So it's a section of DNA which has an operator region, a promoter region, and three structural genes, LACZ, LACY, and LACA. So here we have a promoter region, the function of which will become clear in a moment, followed by the operator region, and then after these two, we have the three important structural genes. And by structural genes, by this we mean they create proteins.
So these are the actual genes coding for proteins for lactose metabolism. The first one is LACZ, the second one is LACY, and the last one is LACA. And finally, there's one more section of DNA located near the LAC operon, but not exactly included in the operon. And this contains the regulatory gene, or LAC-I. And that's this region here. So it's quite far away from the operon because this is other DNA that we don't need to worry about. But this is the regulatory gene. So let's talk about what each of these genes code for. The LAC-Z gene codes for the enzyme known as beta-galactosidase. And this basically catalyzes the hydrolysis of the disaccharide lactose into glucose and galactose. So here we have the disaccharide lactose, the respiratory substrate. And in order to be respired, it needs to be broken down into glucose and the other monomer, which is galactose. So in order to do this and to break that bond, it needs to carry out hydrolysis. And the enzyme which catalyzes this, because it's a hard reaction to carry through on its own, is the beta-galactosidase. And that's encoded for on this first part of the structural genes, the LAC-Z. After the LAC-Z gene, we have the LAC-Y gene, and this codes for the membrane carrier protein, lactose permease. And this just helps to transport the lactose into the bacterial cell. So the lactose is obviously floating around in their environment, and they need to, in order to respire it, get it into the cell. And they do this through a particular carrier protein, which is encoded for by this LAC-Y gene. And this protein is called lactose permease. You can remember this because permease refers to permeability, and so when this is being transcribed, the bacteria is now permeable for the lactose to enter the cell. The LAC-A region, we don't really understand the purpose for this yet, but we know it's important for the lactose metabolism. The promoter region is a section of DNA where the RNA polymerase binds in order to begin the transcription. So remember, this whole molecule is DNA, and in transcription we turn DNA into RNA because this is what's read by the ribosomes. In order to make RNA from DNA, we have to use the enzyme RNA polymerase, and this is used all the time in transcription. So normally this has to bind and then be able to make RNA from these various genes. So normally if this is about to begin transcription, the RNA polymerase binds to this region, which is the promoter. So you can see here that RNA polymerase is bound to the promoter, and what it will do from here is move along making RNA from the DNA. And as it does this, the RNA can go and then be translated into a protein. We then have the regulatory gene, the LAC-I, all the way over here, away from the operon. And this gene codes for a protein which prevents the transcription of the structural genes. So we call it a repressor protein. So here's the LAC-I gene. And what's happening is when it gets transcribed, RNA is made from it, and the RNA gets translated by the ribosomes into a protein, and we call this the repressor protein. And the repressor protein basically stops these genes from being transcribed. So it stops lactose metabolism from happening. And then finally, the operator region is a section of DNA between the promoter and the other enzyme genes. And this is where the repressor protein binds to, to prevent pr transcription. So the operator region is this orange region here. And essentially, the repressor protein, which has been made by that LAC-I gene, will go and bind here, and it stops transcription of these other genes. So now that we know what each of these regions do, we're going to talk about how it works together to control whether these genes are switched on or off. So first, let's talk about how we repress the transcription of the lac operon, i.e. how we keep it turned off. In the absence of lactose, for example, if there's plenty of glucose, the transcription of the LAC genes is always repressed. The genes are always switched off. So in this environment, we have no lactose. And so if there's no lactose, the cell doesn't want to start making the enzyme which metabolize the lactose. This is a waste of resources. So these need to be turned off. And so the transcription is constantly being turned off. Well, how are they being turned off? The reason for this is because the regulatory gene LAC-I is always switched on. So the production of the repressor protein is basically happening all the time. So here's the LAC-I gene, and the important thing about this gene is that it's always on, no matter what's happening. So if it's always on, it's making RNA, and it's being translated, and it's making its product protein, which we said before is the repressor protein. 
So this is always happening, this is always being made. We also said before that the repressor protein goes and binds to the operator region, and this is how it stops transcription. The operator region is next to the promoter region. So the repressor protein goes all the way down to the operator region, and it binds to it and kind of sticks onto it like a kind of blockade. The reason it does this is because when it's bound, it prevents the RNA polymerase enzyme from being able to bind, and therefore prevents transcription of the structural genes. So remember, the RNA polymerase enzyme is the enzyme which turns the DNA into RNA so that the proteins can be made. And it wants to bind to the promoter and allow transcription of these genes. The trouble is, if the repressor protein is bound to the operator region, it blocks the polymerase from binding. So this means that the RNA polymerase can't bind to the DNA, and therefore transcription cannot occur. So to recap, we've got a LAC I gene constantly making the repressor protein. The repressor protein is binding to the operator region, and by doing so, it blocks the RNA polymerase from being able to bind to this area and transcribing these important lactose genes, which would be a waste if there's no lactose because it's making enzymes that aren't needed. So this is happening all the time. So now we've talked about how the gene is constantly switched off, we need to talk about how transcription of the LAC operon can be induced, or in other words, turned on. The presence of lactose in the environment induces the transcription of the structural genes, allowing the production of the beta-galactosidase and lactose permease proteins. So say now the lactose has become present in the environment, and if it's present, then the bacteria want to use it in respiration, so they need these enzymes to be switched on, the enzyme to break it down, and the permease protein to let it into the cell. So we need to start turning these on. The lactose molecule itself acts as an inducer. An inducer is something which turns on genes. And it does this by binding to the repressor protein, which is being made all the time, and it causes it to change its shape. So here's the lactose molecule, and by chance, some of it gets into the cell. We want it to go through permease, but only a tiny bit gets through anyway. It binds to the repressor protein, which is being made by that lac I gene from before, and the repressor protein, remember, is what's turning off the transcription of these genes. When it binds, it causes a shape change. And remember, for proteins, shape changes are very significant events. The shape change prevents the repressor protein from being able to bind to the operator region. So normally, the repressor protein wants to bind to the operator to stop RNA polymerase from transcribing these genes. But now it can't do this because it's bound to lactose and it's changed its shape. So the operator won't want to bind to this anymore. So because it's no longer binding, RNA polymerase is able to bind to the promoter, and then it allows transcription of the structural genes to occur. So at this point, the repressor protein is leaving or can't bind, which means that now there's a free spot for the RNA polymerase to bind. And of course, now that it can bind, it can move along the LAC operon and transcribe these genes into this long RNA, which will then make the various proteins the galactosidase, the LAC permease, and the LAC A protein. So overall, the LAC operon is only expressed when the inducer, the lactose, is present. So this conserves resources. If it's present, we make the lactose enzymes to be able to metabolize it. However, if it's absent, it inhibits the production of its proteins so that we don't waste amino acids and the cell can focus on other processes which are more important. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.